Well, good afternoon, everybody. And uh, I suppose with a, a surname of Boyle, it might have been inevitable that at some point I might be working in heating or something like that, boilers or something. I must admit, my favourite uh, one of that, it's interesting where people end up working, was uh, I was in uh, a reception about 10 years ago in Georgetown in Washington, introduced to the, the, the senior lobbyist of the American Wind Energy Association, whose name was Randy Swisher. So obviously inevitable. Um, I suppose in terms of biomass, I've got it pretty bad. I mean, I own woodlands and I sort of uh, consult on it and do all sorts of things. Um, but it has given me, you know, fairly solid feet on the ground in terms of what it, what it means, some of this biomass stuff and the reality of uh, owning and running and managing woodlands. And uh, as a nod towards Craig Sams, who knows a lot more about charcoal biochar than I do, we, we've actually the last two years done some experiments and small scale charcoal making and it's, it's quite hard work at that level but I know he's doing it in a lot more uh, commercial sort of a way. We do a lot of this stuff for a mixture of uh, wood fuel, biodiversity, we've got rare butterflies and so on so it's quite an interesting balance and some of those same issues that are coming up in the, the biomass debate, energy, foods, biodiversity, the very micro scale we kind of deal with. Um, very much struck uh, at lunch, uh, Richard, uh, in his inimitable way, pointing out that everybody's got bored with climate change and really it's other issues such as energy security that are much more topical. I think that's probably right at the, at the moment. And those of you who can't see the cartoon, there's a president of Iran with his petrol pumps facing the, the American Air Force saying, draw. And uh, I think we're very conscious at the moment of that particular issue rippling through. What I'm going to talk about very briefly and then hopefully hand over seamlessly to Peter is, I suppose, six good reasons why modern biomass is, is quite a good option at the moment if your objective is to reduce carbon. But also four issues you've got to be very careful with if you're not to end up with very poor energy systems, higher emissions and... and problems that lead to further global regional tension and disorder. So why, but what is biomass? Well, it's like one of those scientific things um, everybody pretends to know, and they don't really. Uh, if you go to cocktail parties and you say you're in biomass, you don't get quite looked at as though you're an accountant these days. They sort of, it looks sort of greenish and okay, but nobody really has a clue what it is. And actually, it's, it's quite interesting because of the renewables, it's probably the most versatile uh, and flexible of the renewable sources because it covers any, any type of biomass you can think of, from chicken litter to trees. There's lots of biomass lining the walls of this room. And the important thing about it, why it's important in my view, is that in terms of the main end uses that we really need commercial energy for, heat, power, liquid transport fuels, and I would add chemicals, Biomass can provide solutions to all of those, and that does give it a bit of an edge when you're looking at the sort of reductions that Jim was outlining there, quite draconian reductions. So the context there, and it's a brief snapshot, is that at the moment, um, of the 13% uh, of renewables recorded in commercial um, global energy use, um, a very big chunk of that, more than three quarters, is from bioenergy. And that's broken down, and the majority of that is woody biomass. Now, it's fair to say that a chunk of that woody biomass is not being used in a sustainable way. Possibly a third of that, we wouldn't regard that as sustainable. But the rest is. And so, important in the context that actually, at the moment, um, biomass is actually providing more for the global energy consumption side of things than nuclear right now, despite 50 years of, of very extensive subsidies, Ian, and support. So what are the key drivers? Fossil fuel costs, clearly an issue, and the issue of imports and the security of supply. Uh, we are, the reason why the coalition government is still going down the route for doing a range of programs because we were signed up to an EU target, 15% renewables by 2020. So we're on track, we don't want to get fined, we don't want to not meet the target. Uh, and obviously we've got long-term carbon reduction aspirations, 80% by 2050. Although something like that for a five-year government, it's kind of, it's never quite there, is it? It's always a little bit further away. Uh, local planning rules, still a lot of planning developments require 10, 20% renewables, and that is driving 
local developments, and, and biomass does quite well on a number of those. And one thing I would stress, there's a number of government ministers like to talk about the green economy. Very few of them, I think, really know, <laughs> know what that means. I would say that in the, the biomass sector, particularly woodland, forestry, etc., that's where you'll find some indication of what the real green economy is and what's emerging. So, why consider modern biomass? Mature and versatile range of technologies, from very small up to multi-megawatt power plants and massive ethanol plants in the, the Midwest, etc., and everything in between. It's not an intermittent source. It's a way of storing solar and earth energy, in, in a way. So that actually, it's a 24-7, 365 days of the year type of energy, which is quite important. If everything was intermittent, you have to work much harder. And it does integrate pretty well with fossil fuel um, systems at the moment. Um, there's quite a lot of fuel globally, uh, regionally, and also in the UK. We're not the most wooded country in Europe by any stretch, very clearly, and there's nobody trying to pretend you can run the whole of the UK on biomass, but you can get a decent proportion there, and I'll, I'll put some flesh on that. Um, and it is a genuine low-carbon option, though you've got to be careful with liquid transport fuels. In certain scenarios, the the carbon reductions are not quite as attractive as, as people think, but in many of the other areas, you do get real carbon reductions. Uh, and cost-effectiveness, Ian's talked about affordability. I would agree with you. I think uh, biomass can cover its backside pretty well on, on a number of the areas on affordability. Range, you know, there's an example of some of the boilers from room heaters all the way up to large steam and CHP and power plants. Um, lots of interesting technologies, a lot of which are now mature, very common across Europe, and a number of which are coming through still in the commercial demonstration sort of phase at the moment. I'm not expecting you to read this. The point of this is, and it is confusing, but the point of it is that um, what it is showing you, there is a multitude of conversion options, whether it is straightforward combustion, fermentation, etc., which at the end of the day, under these processes, leads to useful energy for heat, power, and liquid transport. And um, that, I think, is, is the key message to get over in this particular part of the presentation. It can actually do quite a lot. The technology is very interesting, and it's well developed. Um, again, this is a busy one. The important part of there is there are a number of those technologies that are at the far end which are fully commercial. Um, there are a number of others that are early commercial and, and several that are in that basic and uh, demonstration sort of phase, but a range of technologies, and Peter, I know, is going to be talking about some of those technologies following me. Uh, the renewable heat side is beginning to take off big time. We've just had the renewable heat incentive brought in last year and on target for 90,000 biomass heating projects. We're behind the curve, I might say, on this one, but uh, things are picking up o over recent months. Reason two, it's not dependent on intermittent energy. Uh, I'm amazed the number of people that keep writing the paper and saying, wind doesn't blow all the time, you know, as though, you know, this is the first time anybody's kind of cottoned onto that one. And, and obviously there are a lot of people who work the grid who are quite used to intermittent and actually quite clever and know how to predict and plan and so on. But I would accept that it does cost a bit more to manage. So biomass, you, you don't really have that sort of problem because it's predictable. Um, for well-designed systems, you can go 100% with biomass. But in many instances, going for 20, 70, 80% is often much more cost-effective. It does integrate well with fossil fuel systems and the existing heating and grid vehicle systems. So base load, yeah, biomass is pretty good. Use fossil fuel more expensive as a backup and a top-up for peak. If you want to use it as the main source, then fossil fuels, again, can integrate that well. It can also feed into existing heating systems like here. You'd be struggling to put ground source heat pumps in here because of the size of the, uh, the radiators and so on, the fact that it hasn't got underfloor heating. But with biomass, you can do that. Power plants clearly integrate into the grid, and biomass has a role there. CHP systems, again, self-supply or into the grid and heat network. And liquid fuels, obviously, blending 10 15% is common in the States, and there's a whole load of issues on there on is that really sustainable and the level of subsidies, and I would share some of those concerns. 
quite a lot of fuel available. Um, depending on the, the assessments, 25 to 100% of existing energy demand globally is available from biomass. Lots and lots of assumptions in there. We could have a whole CBD on what the real numbers are. Europe, very conservative assumptions. About 25% total energy demand could come from a range of biomass sources and technologies. In the UK, a bit more modest. I've put very conservatively around about 10% of our heating, perhaps 5% of our transport, and around about 10% of our power from a range of um, biomass resources. That's the one I showed earlier. I'm going to jump through there. And that's just really re-emphasizing the global potential. Into the UK, that's where it's split at the moment. And, and Peter will be picking up a couple of the sectors in here in terms of how we use biomass at the moment, which is quite a wide range, as you can see. The trajectory at the moment is to triple that by 2020 and then extend sort of beyond that point. Biomass, oops, go back one, is a genuine low carbon option. For heating, particularly where there's local fuel, you're into the high 80s, low 90s in terms of CO2 reductions. For imported fuel, it's obviously going to be a bit less than that because of transport emissions. For power plants, if it's just a power only, low plant efficiencies will cut that carbon saving, but there is a carbon saving. For liquid biofuels, yes. I mean, I think that's probably the most problematical area for uh, for biomass, there should be in good systems uh, ethanol, biodiesel, at least a 50% CO2 saving benefit if you do it correctly. But I would appreciate in some in instances uh, the savings are not as big as people think. Cost effectiveness, capital costs are higher like most renewables, but actually wood chip at the moment is the cheapest fuel in the UK. And there are a lot of sub 10 year paybacks quite a number of five-year paybacks under the renewable heat incentive. So it's, it's a good cost-effective option. Co-firing, that's a whole sort of issue. It's very much dependent on policy. It's policy-driven and not a very efficient way of using biomass, but it doesn't need a lot of uh, uh, subsidy and support. Number of advanced technologies, still very expensive and will require support if they're to come through commercially. Uh, I'm going to leave anaerobic digestion for Peter, because he knows a lot more than I do. Liquid transport fuels do need substantial subsidies. That's just a summary of where the range of uh, fuels for heating at the moment. As you can see, wood chip, wood pellet do very well. Very briefly, it's not a panacea for everything, and it's not uh, an option without its issues and problems. Uh, choosing the technology wisely, sizing, being clear about your strategy. The second one, very difficult, avoiding the long-term trap of, of subsidies, being stuck in subsidies, and ethanol in the States is, is the case in point. Massive lobby now, very difficult to see <laughs> a new president is actually going to be able to reduce that level of subsidy. And obviously there's the well-known food versus energy conundrum, uh, which you, know, you could spend three days on that one and, and still not be clear. Bottom line on, on, with biomass, and just to really sort of sum up, to really do biomass effectively, in fact, you actually need a long-term strategy for forestry, agriculture, and waste management. So it's quite complicated. And long-term strategies are not things that, particularly that the government is good at. But overall, in terms of biomass, I'd say looking at the renewables and the pluses and minuses of, of the technologies and what's available, I think biomass has got a lot going for it. I'll just leave you with a quote at the end. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Stuart. Very much.